we're <laughs> have the privilege of talking to Sherry. Sherry is a 20 year serial entrepreneur who has written, and this still astounds me, more than 30 books, including a memoir. She has the published author blueprint program, which I've been the beneficiary of, and I'm actually making progress on the book that I'm writing. Maybe we'll talk a little bit further about that in this conversation today. Welcome, Sherry. Thank you, Steve. I'm happy to be here. Awesome day to have you. So Sherry, 30 books, and it's not like you wrote those 30 books over 30 years. You wrote those 30 books in a rather compressed period of time, didn't you? Yes, I was, uh, well, I had suppressed my desire to write for about 50 years, so I had a lot of pent-up words. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote them over a period of about five or six years. Wow. So that's about five or six books a, a year. I actually slowed down <laughs> toward the end. I, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I believe I wrote eight books the first year. Wow. Um, some Somewhere north of 850,000 words. But that that is... was, let's, let's have a caveat there. Even though I write cleanly, that was first drafts, and I was not responsible for editing them because uh, most of them were I was most of them were written uh, as a ghostwriter. I did write two or three of my own books and uh, learned much to my chagrin that they did need editing. <laughs> <laughs> Which I've heard you say many times because you have a, a background, a degree, at least in, actually, what is your degree in? It's, it's a simple BA in English literature. In English literature. a very good uh, grounding in uh, starting with about the sixth grade and on through middle and high school in uh, grammar because they used to teach that. <laughs> <laughs> grammar, <laughs> punctuation, spelling. They used to teach that uh, rigidly. So that's where that came from. Understand. And it's interesting to me how things change over time. One of the things that I was chagrined to learn is that they no longer really teach penmanship, which... <laughs> they don't teach a script... They don't, they don't teach handwriting per se. Um, I, it is a shame because many of our historical documents are uh, penned in, in cursive and the younger generation is not going to be able to read them. Mm. Of course, they can read reproductions in, in TypeScript, but I don't know. It just doesn't seem the same to me. But then... You know, I'm of the generation that says, I just don't know what the world's coming to. <laughs> <laughs> I think each new generation thinks that. <laughs> As we get to this age, yes. <laughs> My age, not yours. <laughs> well, I've certainly had that thought many times myself. So, And actually, I was just having a conversation with my 26-year-old son this morning, and he was expressing similar thoughts. So. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> well, and, and just to uh, let our viewers know what kind of generations we're talking about, I have, I have a 26 and a 28 year old grandson. So uh, my kids are now, yes, saying, I don't know what the world's coming to. <laughs> <laughs> Two of them are millennials, and we didn't know what was going to happen with them. Who, who knew how they were going to survive? Right. It all works out. <laughs> it does. You know, and this brings me to an interesting thought about, you know, the, I've been with yesterday being Memorial Day. I, my thoughts are turning to legacy and, you know, what are we leaving for the next generation? How are, and for that matter, how are we building 
in our own lives and our own businesses upon the foundations that others have, have laid for us, which is brings us to books. My father-in-law spent pretty much the whole time that I knew him, and I would I knew him. Martha and I got married in 1995. No, 93. We got nine, married in 93. We had our first. Oh, oh you're in, in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Martha better not see this. <laughs> uh, she did the same thing yesterday. So I oh. agree. <laughs> you're probably okay then. <laughs> but I can tell you the day. <laughs> but we got married in 93, had our first child in 95. We. And in that time, my father-in-law wrote, I don't know how many books, but he was a, approaching the end of his career. And he spent the next 20 plus years writing books to capture his stories. In fact, three of his, at least three of his books are called Grandpa's Stories, Book One, Book Two, and Book Three. That, all with the intention wonderful. of passing on all that he knew to the next generations. That's wonderful. That's, that's incredible. So many don't. And it's so important. I agree. And I, as the newsletter that I sent out today, this morning, the golden nugget, I compared the legacy that my kind of compared, but I talked about my dad's legacy and my father-in-law's legacy and dad didn't write much. He, his craft was more along the lines of painting. And he spent the last 20 plus years of his life doing watercolor painting and, you know, developing that craft. And both of those crafts give us something that tell us a little bit about the individual. I think books are, are in a a special category of their own. And as you can see behind me, I this is a very, very small portion of all the books that, that we have. But these books here are all Charles Dickens books. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he lived well over a century ago. And we still have his legacy today because of the efforts that he created in in writing these books right yeah. so what i'm thinking is you know not only does our writing help us to explore who we are and what we have to say help us create a relationship with our audience and, and you know one of the nice things about writing a book and, and publishing our book while we're still living is that we can enjoy those relationships today mm -hmm. right so what are your thoughts on why writing a book? What, what does writing a book do for us that other things do not? Well, you, you said just a moment ago, creating a relationship with your audience. And I think to some extent, it helps create a relationship with yourself as well. You know, I, I tend to quote a, a colleague uh, who says writing a book is an act of courage. And it really is because if you, if you look at the statistics and you know, you know what, uh, uh, okay. You've got Charles Dickens in my mind and I can't remember the other guy's name. I will in a second, but what he said, uh, darn it. Mark Twain mm. said about statistics. Do you, do you know that quote? Yeah. The three times, three kinds of lies. Yes. Lies, lies, damned, damned lies, lies, and lies. statistics. But if you look at the statistics, uh, people say there about 70% of us want to write a book, believe we have a book in us. And yet nowhere near 70% of us go ahead and write those books. And it doesn't matter what kind of book you're talking about, whether it's a, cre you know, a creative book like poetry or fiction, well, poetry isn't fiction. Poetry is creative nonfiction. It doesn't matter whether it's that, whether it's memoir, whether it's essays, whether it is a, a client attracting book, which is what I teach. Um, any of those types of book, 
pull something out of you that you didn't know you had, unless you're one of those people who can't not write. Mm. Now, I envy that person. Those people (laughs) have been writing since they were able to hold a pencil and form a letter, and they never stopped writing. Um, I always wanted to write, but as you know, I suppressed that desire for a good 50 years because of imposter syndrome, and that's what stops a lot of us. But when you get right down to it, overcoming imposter syndrome to the extent that you can get your thoughts down on paper and have the desire at least for other people to read them is a tremendous act of courage. And it teaches you things about yourself that um, you should be proud of. Mm. I agree. And I don't know. If I am one of those people, I know that I am now one of those people who cannot not write. When I don't write, even on a daily basis, I feel like my day, there's a big hole in my day, right? Mm -hmm. But I spent decades, not so much suppressing my writing, because writing was always something I turned to in order to work something out. And sometimes that was just, you know, writing in a journal, but sometimes it was actually writing a novel. But, but the, the point that, that you make is that when we have the courage to take what we're writing and to share it with other people so that they can benefit from it, so that we can create that relationship. Absolutely. And, and those are, I think, two very important elements that, that by writing, we get to know ourselves better. As I have made a daily practice of writing for the last eight, plus years it has enriched my life in ways that i can't even begin to to describe it's only been in the last year or so that i really started to make an effort to write in a way that connects with my audience Mm -hmm. what was the impetus for that steve what what caused that transformation (laughs) that's a really good question something that I probably will have to write about in order to figure out, but (laughs) I will make an attempt of it right now. So one of the things that, that shifted for me was realizing that, well, one, that people do want to hear what I have to say. Um, Yes. So you have overcome imposter syndrome because part of that is who am I to write a book? Who would even read it? Yes. Why would anybody be interested? And now you know, people are interested. Yes. People value your insight. You have tremendous insight and wisdom, and people want to know. So yeah. that's why uh, writing coaches say the world needs your book hmm. because your perspective is unique in all the world. Absolutely. And that's one of the things I think is fascinating about story and books in in general and lives in general is that, you know, there are 7 billion people on the planet right now, give or take. And I think it's more give, but (laughs) each one of us has a unique story. Each one of us has a unique perspective that if each one of us were to write our own story, write our own book, we would end up with 7 billion different versions of a book. What a a rich garden. (laughs) No one can read 7 billion books. I've managed to read only about 6,000 or so in my lifetime. And uh, I doubt I'll get to another (laughs) 6,000 because I'm on, I'm well into the second half, but um, yeah. Can you imagine and each one of those stories has, you know, has nuggets of wisdom to unfold and to share and to help us create a richer life ourselves. Mm-hmm. The other thing to answer or further your question about what shifted for me was for not worrying about the numbers, not worrying, at least not being hyper focused on the numbers, where, you know, if I put out a post and I didn't get any response to it. Or if I put out over the last 
I don't know, I guess I'm on my 42nd or 43rd Facebook Live that I've been doing in my in my business page. And when I first started out, one of the reasons I didn't do Facebook Lives is because it really bothered me when nobody joined me live. Mm-hmm. And I, I took that as a, a weakness on my part that it was evidence that people didn't want to hear what I have to say. And since then, accepting two things. One, that, you know, everybody's got their own schedules, you know, and not everybody can show up when I go live, you know, and recognizing that in my own self, that when I see other people going live, I sometimes have the time and the energy to tune into that. But a lot of the time I don't. And it's not because I don't want to hear what they have to say. It's just that it isn't working out, which is why I think it's so important that we be consistent in our craft, you know, be consistent in putting our story out there, be consistent in sharing what we have with other people. Absolutely. And, you know, this, um, this would, this time, for example, would normally be a time that I'm writing. And um, but you are two, two hours ahead of me. I'm just getting my day started. You're in the middle of yours. And uh, it's, it isn't always convenient to tune in. But, you know, I suppose everybody has a love-hate relationship with Facebook. But thank goodness they, uh, they allow you to leave it up there so that people can come and watch it when it is convenient for them. I frequently watch Facebook lives uh, in the evening, Hmm. uh, particularly if my husband is watching some television show that I'm not interested in, or more likely these days it's YouTube. Hmm. (laughs) So we sit companionably with our headphones on and I listen to what I want to listen to. And he listens to what he wants to listen to. (laughs) We're in the same room. That's, that's being (laughs) together, isn't it? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that reminds me of Friday night is my wife and I, Martha's and I date night and Martha's recommendation for our date night on Friday, this last Friday was to, for each of us to read, but not read together. We would just be, you know, probably sitting on the bed and each reading our own book, but we're together and, and each yeah. enjoying our own story. And that's one of the things that's nice about books is that they have a long shelf life. I mean, going going back to the Charles Dickens books, you know, those are written in the 19th century. Well, think Chaucer, written in the Mm. 16th century and even beyond. My college minor was classic civilizations. We were Mm. reading Aristophanes and Sophocles and... uh, people who are thousands of years dead so uh, but I'll bet you and Martha do what my husband and I do when we're both reading our separate stories we will uh, ask the other person can I read you this and Mm. read them a funny part or an interesting part or something he reads science fiction Mm. I read romantic suspense, but I really love a, a comedic turn of phase, phrase. So I'll, I'll read him two or three paragraphs to set him up. And then, then he gets the punchline and he's off and he goes, okay. <laughs> okay. You had to be there. <laughs> yes. There's a lot of that that goes on in my house. Is I'm sure. <laughs> it could be Martha or myself or my son, Joshua, who is also an avid reader. In fact, all of my family is pretty avid. Well, at least five of the six of us are are pretty avid readers. (laughs) And we will each share the experience with each other just because it's, you know, it's cool to be able to share it, to to say, you know, this is a really neat way that this person, this either the scene, the way that they set it up, the character, or just the phrasing that they used in order to describe a certain idea. You know, it, it's pretty cool that we can share things like that. It is. So tell me, you were talking about a client attracting book. 
what makes a client attracting book different from say Charles Dickens or does it? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, a lot. <laughs> Charles Dickens books are very long. A client attracting book doesn't need to be and shouldn't probably be. Uh, Charles Dickens books uh, tell a story, but it's a, a fictional story. It's a made up story. A client attracting book uh, the way I teach it is designed to allow your client to know, like, and trust you, which everyone nowadays knows that that's the way to do it. Uh, it's, it's no longer the days of standing in front of a rented Learjet and saying, look how much money I made and you can too. <laughs> <laughs> it just doesn't work. People have gotten more sophisticated online, even if they can't see your face, which most of the time they can. But um, someone, I wish I could remember who, so I could give them credit. Um, someone made me aware of the phrase, the transformational industry. Mm. And um, that is such a, a much quicker way of saying things than uh, coaches course creators, authors, and, and speakers. Uh, anyone whose business is creating transformation in other people require uh, even more trust mm. than, uh, say, a car dealership. <laughs> 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 that people are trusting you with their lives, their inner lives, which is even more important to them than their money. And mm. if, if they don't know you and haven't determined that they like you, how in the world will they trust you? Mm. So that, that all goes into what I mean by a client attracting book. Now, obviously, and, and you have heard this multiple, multiple times, you need to write the book that your client wants to read. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's where I differ a little bit from other uh, book coaches. And I differ a lot from fiction writers who have not yet learned that even though they have a great deal of passion about their story, if the story doesn't meet the reader's expectations, it's not going to sell. Mm. So, uh, you know, there, a lot goes into it. Probably Absolutely. more than we can get to right now. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you make a good point about meeting expectations, right? Mm -hmm. That... That in a way that there's a contract between the author and the reader, between mm, absolutely for that matter, between the marketer and the client or customer, mm -hmm. that when we don't meet expectations, when we go along on our merry way and say, you know, I don't need to worry, I don't need to listen to my audience because what I'm doing is just awesome. <laughs> The analogy that's coming to mind for me right now is, is when Coke came out with their new Coke back in, when was it, the 80s? or there I don't all. recall, but absolutely, that's one of the examples that marketers give. So like, it's you know, statistical, yeah. you know, my way or the it. highway. <laughs> <laughs> and it was supposed to be new and improved. And I think they actually did a fair amount of market research with it, but just they didn't meet their clients, their customers, their audience is expectations and immediately had to turn things around yeah. and recapture, recommit to the contract that they had with their clients. Right. A, a big brand like that, clients expect Coke to taste a certain way. If it tastes a different way, then you're right. They've broken a contract. They've broken a promise. Um, and it, it's the same with us, even though we don't have a hundred or 200 year legacy, whatever Coke is up to now, but it's, um, you know, it's all about being who you say you are. Mm. 
Yeah. And so what are the elements? How do you determine what your audience's expectations are and how do you meet those expectations with the book that you're writing? Well, you ask them, uh, you know, in, in the last iteration of the course that you have taken, which by the way, is going to get a new name soon. <laughs> um, one of the students asked the questions that I, I assigned her to ask and discovered her followers didn't want the book that she had in mind. Mm. They were not interested in that book. So not only is it egotistical to just go write your book without your audience in mind, but it also could be a huge wasted effort if they don't want to read it. Now, a a lot of people are very, you know, and and I can, I can hear, I can hear the uproar out there, but I know what I'm talking about. Yes, you do. Have you ever heard the, uh, the phrase, Uh, sell them what they want, give them what they need. Mm -hmm. Therein lies the transformation. You must also give them what they want. Yes. But uh, if what they want is not going to get them to the goal that they say they want, then you must pull from your expertise and, and give them also what they need to reach that goal. Mm. And, you know, you can't always do that in a book. And that's another part of the client attracting book. When you're in the transformational industry, you really can't do it in a book. Probably 1% of the population, if that, can read a book and do it for themselves without guidance, Hmm. without uh, instruction, without encouragement and accountability. And that's why the the book is there to it's there to transform the the audience's belief in what they can do from i can't do this to yes i can all i need is some guidance so, so and that's where another- stories come in because y- you know this your own story about how you overcame whatever you're teaching other people to overcome. Is that my phone? I'm so sorry. Um, I can't turn it off. (laughs) Hopefully you can't hear it very well. Uh, The, the mother phone is on my husband's desk behind me. Mm. Uh, What's behind me in this image is not what's actually behind me. (laughs) Anyway, where was I? I lost my train of thought. The... Oh, to bring them from the belief that they can't to the belief that they can mm. with guidance. And that requires right. your stories. That requires you saying, look, I, I can, I've got you because I did it. Mm. I may have done it with guidance also, but I've got you. Yes. And when, when you have convinced someone within your book that you've got them, and you should be, you should be telling the truth. <laughs> <laughs> then they will work with you as you wish a client to work with you. They'll put their, themselves in your hands and you can then effect the further transformation to get them further along toward their goal or all the way there. Hmm. Uh, in my case, um, I teach the business of books. I don't teach the craft. So someone else might have to take them a little further if they're, if, for example, if they're writing fiction um, and they need some craft work, that's not me. Mm. I I can refer them to someone, but that isn't me. I can get them to the point where they know they have to meet expectations and that they can do it. There's a method, there's a path, there's a blueprint (laughs) and, um, And they can do it. Absolutely. So what I'm hearing is (laughs) that, what was that? And it doesn't need to take a year. (laughs) Or two or three. Or Or a lifetime. I, it, it breaks my heart. I see people on, 
on other Facebook groups saying, I've been writing my book for three years now or five. Get that thing out. You're done. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it reminds me of, I often think of that it took JK Rowling six years to put out to get her first book published and then she published the next six books in i think six years so she never stopped writing the books she knew mm. she had something that was publication worthy and she never stopped writing so she was poised nowadays we call it rapid release mm. <laughs> and we're yes. talking months rather than years but um which is quite a craft. So what I'm hearing is two things. One, that the book is part of the journey, not the whole of the journey, both Absolutely. for the author and for the reader. That when you start with a book, that if you can go from that book to a course or to some coaching or to consulting or whatever it may be, that you'll get more from the relationship than if you just read the book. And that was honestly part of my journey. It was, I've always been an avid reader. I'm on track roughly to, to read another hundred books this year. And, you know, I can read a hundred books. I can read 200 books, whatever. It doesn't, the, the quantity isn't what's important. And, but, and my point is, is that you can read all the books in the world, but if you don't actually start acting on those books, it doesn't matter how many books you read, that you've right. got to actually take what you're learning and put it into practice. True. And sometimes you need to see it and be guided by the hand. You, uh, you know, you can, you can read the words, uh, I'm reminded of back when I was an IT specialist um, and uh, people didn't read the documentation mm -hmm. uh, in, in computer work. And we used to say, when all else fails, read the directions. <laughs> well, sometimes the directions leave things out because it's experts who have written the directions and they have what's called expert blindness. Yes. So yes. you really have to have a, 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 a back and forth, a conversation, a dialogue, yeah. a dialogue uh, because you may not know what your reader needs to know that you didn't put in your book. Mm, yes. Yeah. <laughs> that reminds me that when I come across those tech books or instructions is that I oftentimes hand it over to Martha, because one, she has a whole lot more patience with that type of thing than, than I do. If I can't figure it out intuitively within, you know, a, a moment, which I actually am pretty good at doing, but when it get, goes beyond that ability, I'd much rather her explain it to me than to have to wade through the tech document. Okay. <laughs> So I happen to have an IT specialist in my household. <laughs> that was my husband's uh, career. So when I can't figure it out, I just leave the computer and tell him to figure it out and do it for me. <laughs> <laughs> I go yeah. bake cookies to reward him. <laughs> that sounds like a pretty good deal. But it's that I see the same thing with the relationship between, you know, any kind of book and the change that you want to be, the transformation that you want to be creating, mm -hmm. right? That there, there is the book aspect of it. And then there's all the stuff that, that surrounds that book, you know, the, the creating the relationship, you know, helping people see what they don't otherwise see. Mm -hmm. And for that matter, you know, there's the, there's a reader part of it and there's the author part of it, that there's the, the reader's opportunity to take what they get from that book or that and see how they're going to implement it in their lives. But it's also the, the author's responsibility and opportunity to figure out how to take what they've written in this book and create that audience, create that relationship, create that visibility for themselves. Mm -hmm. Yes, the book has to be engaging. Uh, and that's to some extent where craft comes in. Uh, and that's where stories come in. Uh, the book 
the book needs to leave the reader wanting more. Mm -hmm. And whether that more is working with you, working with someone else or reading another book, each book should leave them wanting more while satisfying what they picked up the book in the first place for. Mm. So it, it's like, um, it's like an appetizer for your, for the rest of your books, because I truly believe that just one book is not enough for anybody. And, um, and I also believe that once you write a book, it's kind of addictive. You want to write more and more. Mm. So you can lead step by step by step. But the one thing you cannot do with a book is have a dialogue. Mm. Mm. That's a one-sided conversation. And the dialogue is important if you're in the transformational industry. And you mm. know, I, I'm sorry, I don't know who all your audience is, although I've met quite a few of your followers in your Facebook group. And uh, they're all lovely people. You attract the nicest people. <laughs> <laughs> but if, uh, you know, this is sailing right over the heads of people who don't have a coaching or course creation or speaking business. Uh, so uh, if you have if you have fiction writers and creatives in your audience, maybe we should talk to them as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, most of what I'm producing now, I do write fiction on the weekends, but that's for me more of an avocation than a vocation. It, it, although the two are actually very much intertwined because my perspective is, is that the best storytellers are oftentimes the fiction writers and so if I want to learn the craft of storytelling I go to I do read a fair number of nonfiction books on storytelling but if I want to see the craft in practice I go to the fiction writers because mm -hmm. that's what they do I mean that's you know how do you create a story that's engaging and that that gets you to not only finish to turn the page but to finish the book and to go on to the next one and the next one and the next one. Mm -hmm. you know, so those authors, those fiction authors who are able to create a world, and I tend to read more fantasy than anything in fiction, those people who are able to create that world that I really find engaging, you know, they're doing things in with their craft that few other people are able to do or or that actively do it's a it's a learned skill I, maybe there are a few people who have it intuitively but it is a skill that can be learned and um it, it, here in the u.s and in most of western civilization there's a pattern to what makes a reader satisfied with a story and that pattern can be learned and, um, and emulated. Mm. Now, I found it interesting to discover that patterns in other parts of the world aren't necessarily the same as our, you know, hero's journey. Mm. Uh, especially in Asian countries, the pattern is totally different. Mm. So, uh, I think it would be interesting to study other cultures patterns as well. Uh, hopefully yeah. I'll... One of the things that informs my understanding of both marketing and writing and, you know, sharing stories, communicating with the others is my interest in other languages, you know, that, that by trying to read a, a book in German or Spanish or Welsh or, or whatever, that it, I can much more appreciate why we struggle as marketers and as business owners and as entrepreneurs and transformational leaders to tra to communicate in a way with our audience that they understand it. Because it's as if, you know, when I'm reading Spanish, as I was this morning, you know, I know a decent amount of the, the, the vocabulary, but there is nuances and, and words that, I, that I'm not familiar with. Just as, 
you know, you were, you were talking earlier about more of the, the client attracting books. We're going to put things in there that, that mean a whole lot more to us than will mean to our audience, just because we have the experience that we do with what we're, we're writing about. Mm -hmm. And for that matter, our audience will also pick up on things that appeal to them much more than they appeal to us, just because we have different lenses through which we we view the world right i i'm impressed that you read in other languages i struggled through reading in greek and in french and um before i dropped russian i was trying to read in russian as well I, unfortunately i was a freshman taking all of those languages at once it just wow. didn't it just didn't work <laughs> i had to drop i had to drop um russian but um, that's impressive. It, to do all well, that. <laughs> I couldn't read in any of those languages. Now I can get along okay in Spanish because of I, I have a pretty strong uh, background in Latin roots. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I I wouldn't even attempt it now. <laughs> wouldn't even attempt it i've read in translation and even that sounds odd to me mm. I, I read i've read some scandinavian novels in translation mm. and um, you know there's a cultural element that like you said the nuances uh, i tried to pick up a book by a, a fellow from the uk it was full of slang that I didn't understand. <laughs> I, I very seldom uh, put a book on my did not finish shelf. Mm -hmm. Very seldom. Even if it's, even if it's a bad book, <laughs> I, will come, I will finish it just because I'm a finisher. But, and, and the reason for that is because I haven't always been, and I never got anything done as a youth. So. <laughs> I became a finisher and now I finish everything by Hector, <laughs> including the food on my plate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, so, so what are you reading in Spanish? I'm so impressed. Well, to be completely transparent, the thing that I'm reading, well, I'm reading two things actually in Spanish. I'm reading Alice Walker's, gosh, what is it? T Touched by an arrow, arrow or when, anyways, one of her books of poetry. And on the left-hand side, it's in Spanish and on the right-hand side, it's in English. Uh, but I'm also reading the Book of Mormon in, in Spanish and German. So, okay. So I, I was going to ask you, um, did, did you do your mission in a Spanish speaking country? I did it in West Virginia. West Virginia. Which is a whole nother language. <laughs> yeah, that is a whole nother language. <laughs> we could get into quite some funny stuff in that language. <laughs> yeah, that, that was a very different world. Um, anyway, before we finish up today, I want to touch on a couple of things. One, I know you've got some things going on this, this week. Um, what is it? How can people benefit or connect with what you are producing right now? Okay. Um, as I mentioned to you, the, the course is getting a new name. Right now it's called Published Author Blueprint. And I realized that I was not fulfilling that promise. The course takes you up to the point of writing your first draft, or in your case, your however many. <laughs> I'm not going to call you out for that, but um, it, it doesn't get you published for that. Uh, it requires more handholding and, and that's uh, a coaching program. So I haven't quite figured out the name of it yet. So it's still being called Published Author Blueprint. And I'm doing a webinar, um, especially for your viewers on Wednesday. What's the third? Is that Wednesday? No, uh, Thursday. that's Thursday uh, on Thursday. And I have to admit that I am all messed up with webinar jam. I have created the webinar, but I have not correctly created your link yet. So your viewers <laughs> will have to look in the comments 
for the link to register for that webinar, uh, I'm doing a couple of different things. For one thing, I'm not going to try to teach them the whole course during the webinar. Mm. And for another, I'm not going to keep them for an hour and a half. That's just way too long. Um, I'm going to schedule it for 60 minutes, but if I can get it done in 45 so that they can get a taste of what's included and why, um, then it will be 45. I'm not going to try to stretch it to 90 anymore because that's just overwhelming. <laughs> it is. I've turned One of the things over that I've lead. heard a lot in, in speaking <laughs> is if you can give people an extra five minutes of their day, that'll be the best ending to your speech that you can deliver. Right? Uh -huh, okay. I'll have to remember that for Toastmasters. <laughs> I'm starting over. <laughs> uh, well, great. Do put that in the links in the put that link in the comments. I will do that. I'm looking forward to the next iteration of what you're creating. Okay. Well, and by the way, with regards to, I'm actually one of the things that I was struggling with with regards to completing the book that I've been that you know I've been working on mm -hmm. is that I feel compelled. I can't not not write as as you said earlier. Right. So what I've actually what happened for me last week was I was working on that book and I realized I'm this is actually another book and so I'm now re editing literally editing and going through and figuring out how to to put that last draft together in a finalized form and moving on to a new book, which will be more of what you're talking about with the ideal client attraction book. It's, it's Excellent. Well, you know, we all, when we begin to tell our stories, and I think you've heard this story before, we tend to want to say everything in one book and make it our, our you know, masterpiece magnum opus <laughs> but these days people don't have the time or the patience to read a long book and um it, it's actually better to make a shorter book so the analogy is um and you may get this more than any of your readers uh I am a, a, a former Baptist married to uh, an LDS husband, LDS being Mormon to the rest of the world. And um, my husband once asked me what a Baptist meant when we said born again Christian. Mm. And I began to explain. And about half an hour later, he said, I did not mean for you to start with Genesis. <laughs> 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 he wanted the reader's digest version <laughs> and if i can if i can encourage anybody who is on the brink of of wanting to write a book and being daunted by the task think reader's digest version mm, yes <laughs> yeah the 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 easier it is to consume the the more it will be consumed is my perspective. <laughs> That's true. That's very true. So last two questions for you. One, the question that I ask all my guests, what makes for a richer story? Oh, gosh, don't put me on the spot like that. Um, <laughs> well, it's, I mean, there are several answers to that. Um, one is the technical answer is more detail, more sensory mm. detail. But uh, as you will have learned from knowing me for a year now, uh, I tend to, to tell a lot of short anecdotes to illustrate one point. Mm. And so in, in a full length book, it would probably be more stories. Mm. So more detail, more stories with more detail. <laughs> nice kind of going back to the idea of that the the richer and the more digestible the the content the the easier it will be for others to to get the value out of it yeah i, I mean 
if if people are skipping long passages because you're telling long boring stories <laughs> with <laughs> with no point and no connection to what you were trying to convey they're not getting what you intended them to get <laughs> mm, yes yeah so, the easier that's one of the reasons i appreciate visual stories as much as i do mm -hmm. because our visual mind literally our visual mind has more equipment allocated to it than any other part of our mind so we can that's why one of the reasons a, a picture as they say can tell a thousand words because yeah there are more exactly. resources to to get those thousand words from a single picture right so the the final question i have for you is um and i hope this isn't putting you on the spot but um <laughs> how are you stocking up your treasury of stories oh well that is a question i can answer very easily um i have lived a long life and i am actively uh, as i recall things in conversation with my kids or uh, you know anything that that prompts my memory of something that happened that i uh, I, that I think what my kids would appreciate about our family or uh, might illustrate something that is within my teaching uh, milieu, uh, I write it down. Mm. <laughs> I, have, um, I have a rocket book. Mm. Uh, do you know what a rocket book is? Not really. I, I kind of I, do but not really the, this this camera does not like to it doesn't like <laughs> it doesn't i'm supposed to put it there, we, there, there we go, go. well we, we can see it kind of ethereally <laughs> yeah so sorry about that so a rocket book is a reusable notebook mm -hmm. uh, this one is uh five five by eight i believe and it has 36 pages and you write on it in it with um erasable ink and it has little uh, QR codes on each page and the QR code uh, shows the the app where to put it mm. so I you have to print to get it um, optical character rec recognition so I print my stories and then I scan them and send them to Evernote where I can search them with keywords and I can pull together stories for books or speeches or uh, teaching moments, et cetera. But I'm writing them down just as your father-in-law began writing things down. Mm. Um, I, I hope I have more than 20 years. I'm, I'm shooting for 30. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. But um, I, I'm, capturing them as they come to me. And I encourage everyone to do that, whether they use a rocket book or whether they use their phone uh, voice system to, to create a voice note, mm. uh, whatever you have at hand, be it a scrap of paper or a napkin or some high tech object, uh, write it down because mm. in our busy world, it will be gone in an hour. Yes, at least. Uh, <laughs> you can always flesh it out if you've written down a few keywords. Yes. <laughs> Long I'm answer to a short question. <laughs> I'm often surprised by how quickly this massive aha totally disappears. <laughs> it, it's, yeah, uh, it has to do with short term and long term memory. <laughs> yeah. So if we can use a notebook for or a, a voice recorder or, or whatever in order to, to capture those. Yeah. But, you know, people have their phones with them all the time now. They're, they might as well be, you know, somebody's going to invent a, 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 a snap or something that you can surgically implant to hold your phone on your person. <laughs> so you don't lose it <laughs> so it'll be literally <laughs> attached we'll to you. Borg. <laughs> <laughs> oh my distance is futile <laughs> <laughs> but um every smartphone these days has a has a voice notes function mm. 
Yes. That's probably the quickest thing at hand. Yeah. I happen to be at a desk all day, so I write it down where I can, where I don't have to transcribe it from my voice. Mm, yeah. And you can even do that with Otter. <laughs> yes. As I'm doing right now, actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good for you. Anyway, thank you so much, Sherry, for sharing your wisdom and let's it's go out. It's been a lot of fun. <laughs> You and I could talk for hours. I know we, we've done it before. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Well, we both have a passion for books and for passion for capturing those, those stories that the world has to deliver, that we can make a, a richer, brighter world for all by absolutely. sharing the stories that we have. Yes, absolutely. Please tell your lovely wife hello for me. We'll do the same. Yes, okay. we'll do. Actually, I haven't met your husband, but <laughs> well, he has uh, he has accepted that you and I have a a, a rich conversation now. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I tell him I know your wife, and then and then he relaxes. So <laughs> he's yeah. very shy. He will not get on camera. Okay. Anyway, Martha is happy to be join on camera when she's here, but she's not. She's at work in a different county so, oh okay yeah. all right well so, anyway until our stories meet again be the bright <laughs> light in someone's dark night oh that's beautiful thank you <laughs>